This episode is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twip. Today on Twip Apps, thumbtacks on a map used to mark the places we'd been. But with How to Geo, now your own photos can point to your memories with impeccable precision. What would it take to put your photos on the map? Apparently, not much more than a GPS logger and a curiously named app called How to Geo. Seeing every picture you've made populate a globe on your screen is a fantastic way to relive old memories, find photos based on where, not when, and simply explore your photo library from a whole new dimension. Very few cameras outside of our Android and iPhones have GPS built in, but with the addition of a little piece of hardware, or even an app on your smartphone, you can record precisely where every photo was taken, every time. It's easy, it's fun, and it's from Howda Software. I'm Photo Joseph, and this is Twip Apps. Welcome to another episode of Twip Apps. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today my guest is Pierre Bernard with Howda Software to show us his app, Howda Geo. Pierre, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. It's great to have you on. I'm quite familiar with your software from many, many years ago. Back when I was using Aperture, I know that I used your app several times to merge GPS data with my photos to get that good old geotagging thing going on. It's a, it's a great, great capability that, frankly, more apps should have built in, but I guess the fact that they don't um, helps keep you in business, doesn't it? It does. It's Actually, it's the fact that iPhoto started paying attention to geotags, but never adding them, that really pushed people to the idea of looking into actual geotagging. That's great. So from a very high level view, in case our viewers are not familiar with, well, with how to geo, but also just with geotagging in general, can you tell us from a very high level view, what is geotagging and how does your software fit into this? So geotagging writes location information, so basically GPS latitude and longitude coordinates into the image files. So the exact same thing you would get from a GPS camera or from your iPhone, when you open the photo in Photos, iPhoto, Preview, Lightroom, you can see where it was taken. And you can see it on a map in a very nice graphical interface that shows this is where that photo was taken. And why? Why do people like geotagging? I, for myself, see two purposes in geotagging. The first one is the curiosity to go and check where I was, where that photo was taken. It, I find it gives the photo some context. I, I can retrace my step. I, I can relive the story. Sometimes I even didn't know where I was. I was in a car, in a plane, somebody else was driving, and I can go and check where I was. I can to retrace my steps to that picture. But the real important thing is archival or retrieval. I, I want to be sure to be able to find the photo years down the road. So years from now, I'm going to remember that I once took a great shot of the Eiffel Tower. I don't know when I took that shot. I, I don't even know when I was last in Paris. Sure. But if I have my photos geotagged, I go into a photo cataloging application like Apple Photos or whatever's, whatever you like or whatever is current when I get the idea to look up my old photos. And I can just go to a map, zoom on, into the, onto the Eiffel Tower and find that photo and maybe other photos I took years later from the same spot. Right. And that's important to me. It is. It is. And I, I agree with you completely that I remember when this idea first came out and you're like you said it was iPhoto in places and that's what uh, put this feature on the map no pun intended and it was an incredible thing to suddenly see where our pictures were taken and I think back then all you really could do is just drag and drop your pictures on the map onto a place I think I'm trying to remember did iPhones even have G were I put were iPhones capturing photos with GPS data back when iPhoto first added that did iPhone even exist then I don't remember no, I think ago. places came first. Yeah. Actually, I, I had already a version of uh, how the geo when they announced places. 
Okay. So my first reaction was to be scared. <laughs> I was I was actually at Macworld exhibiting on the uh, show floor mm. when at the keynote they announced the places feature, and then on second look, it it, it was great. They they yeah. didn't actually do geotagging; they just showed locations. They did the and reverse geotagging. Beg your pardon? They did reverse geotagging, right? They they would look up the location based off the coordinates and tell you where on a map it was. Because the geo coordinates don't say Eiffel Tower. They say the one, two, three, dot, blah, 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 and yeah. so on. And so the reverse geocoding, I guess not geotagging, reverse geocoding is what the software did to take those coordinates and turn them into a real location on the map and then apply a name to it, Eiffel Tower, mm -hmm. not just somewhere in Paris. Yeah, and then this thing Apple didn't do back then and they still don't and... I don't think Adobe does either, is actually write the tags back into the images. Mm -hmm. So the, the, with places in, in photos, in iPhoto, you have the location information in your Lightroom catalog. And I don't know when, years from now, I'm going to look up my photo. I don't know if I will be using photos. I'm actually right. still stuck with Aperture. And <laughs> yeah, well, an aperture did allow that aperture allowed the writing of the metadata back into the file. Did it not oh. include the GPS data? I think it did. I, I think they only write on export. I, I mm. they don't go modify the master files. Or you can now call it originals, but yeah, you can. You can in aperture go and tell it to, to modify. It's one of the only, if not the only way to modify the original file is to have Aperture write it back in. But it doesn't matter because Aperture is sadly no longer with us. Um, but so we have this capability in the vast majority of modern photo editing apps and photo management apps to see where your pictures are on the map, assuming that they actually have that data. So as you pointed out, if you have a camera that has GPS built into it, so that would be, of course, your iPhone or Android device, or some of the very few, but there are some cameras out there that actually have a proper camera, DSLR type or point and shoot type that have a GPS receiver in them, writes that data to the picture and that's great. But of course, that's not always the case. In fact, and for most larger cameras, it's not the case. So this is partially where your software, entirely where your software comes in, isn't it? So you've got to get this GPS data captured somehow, somewhere, and then merging that with your photos. So tell us about that process. So there's a lot of ways to, to geotag or geocode photos with the geo to me geocoding is figuring out where i took the photo mm -hmm. and geotagging is the f the writing of those in this information back into the image file Great. so the actual tagging of the files so how the geo has several methods of figuring out where you took a photo the easiest one the fastest one is obviously to carry a gps device so i have this one so that's a gps track logger Okay. That that was a little short of 100 bucks. Uh, now they make cheaper ones. Uh, they don't make this one anymore, but I, I love that one. Now, I, uh, I've, I've owned a few of those over the years, and I know they've gotten progressively better, more accurate, and cheaper, which is great, and uh, better battery life. I mean, what if someone's going to buy one of these, and I don't want to recommend any specific brand of them because there are so many on the market. But what can you generally expect as far as if you're going to carry this thing around with you all day long, do you have to turn it off and back on to save battery life? Do you have to hang it on the outside of your backpack or can you bury it in the bottom of your camera bag? What kind of realistic use can you expect out of one of these devices? I wouldn't keep it inside the bag. I keep it in a, a outside pocket. I, it's not dangling on the outside. I have it in a pocket, but not like deep in a bag. Um, I never had a problem with battery life. I it, I leave it running all day. Sometimes I forget to charge it overnight, and sometimes it makes it makes it through the th second day. Okay. Um, accuracy obviously varies with the manufacturer and the location. So w we once went on a safari in Kenya. So mm -hmm. there's open skies everywhere. You get perfect accuracy. Sure. In the deep trenches of New York City, not so much. Um, what I would look for when buying a GP GPS device is a device that needs no driver. Mm. So the one I have here connects like a USB pen. So it just shows up as a drive on my Mac. Right. Just like any USB pen. And if that would fail me, 
it has a removable uh, mini SD card. I could okay. also take that, plug it in. On longer trips, I would look for a removable battery so I could carry a second one. Mm -hmm. And then also the, the removable memory card could be used if you don't take your laptop to keep one card for every day or couple of days and then move on to the next card. Well, the Those GPS devices, data takes up hardly any space at all, right? Because it's all text. It doesn't take much space. It, I don't know. Uh, I actually, I'm using the mini SD card that was included inside the device. I never took it out because I take my computer where, everywhere I go. Sure. So I, I empty the device every day and never had a problem. Um, I guess the, the, the card they include must be tiny. It usually when is. you get a, a card for free it's going to be not that yeah yeah for sure yeah i know i recall using these and having even a 16 gig card in there meant you could basically go for, for pretty much forever um, they, they, the things don't fill up fast it is just text it's just pure pure text file that it's that is being written okay so you've got one yeah. of these devices it's recording your movements the only thing you really have to remember to do is turn it on at the beginning of the day and then you go out and you shoot and, and you're good to go you get back to your computer and you copy that file off, plug it in, like you said, like a USB thumb drive or something, plug it in, copy that file off, and you've got your pictures and now comes Hootageo. And I know we're going to take a look at this in a moment, so I don't want to go into too much detail of what happens. But at this point, the idea behind your software is it takes the pictures and it takes the GPS coordinates and it merges them together. How does it do that? How does it know what photo belongs with what set of coordinates? Okay, I just checked the, the SD card. It's a one gigabyte card, so it's, one it's really tiny. <laughs> and it's, I, I never fill it up. Um, so those devices, they record where you went, usually like every second or so. They can be set to time intervals, distance intervals, but basically it's once every second they record the, the exact time and the exact position. And then how the geo looks at the time you took your photo and tries to find the two closest points and puts the photos right between those points. Got it. Seeing that it's once every second, you have to travel real fast and still... <laughs> For it not to be accurate. Now that requires that your camera photo time, your camera time be accurate. Yeah, the camera time should be accurate, but anyhow, uh, how the Geo needs to ask you a couple of questions about how you set up your camera time. Okay. So you, while you while you tell how the Geo how the camera t was set up, you can also tell it it was going a second fast or two seconds fast, or it was going like twenty four hours fast. I had some customers who had their camera go a year fast, so that's yep. not going fast. That's a setup mistake. Still works. Of yeah, that's that can be a problem, especially when you travel, because people automatically set their watches if they wear a watch, their phone automatically switches over. And especially today, you don't really have to think about changing the time very on very many things. But your even the computer will, for the most part, will automatically figure out you're in a new location and change the clock for you. But the camera does not. And so it can be very easy to forget to do that. So if you're traveling from even just LA to New York and you got a three hour time difference and you forget. So in how to geo, it is easy enough to say, oops, I forgot to set my, to change my time zone. And Oh, look, the camera was off by two minutes and six seconds anyway. And you can compensate for all of that. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, um, we're going to get into a demo pretty soon here. Oh, I, we haven't even talked about the company itself yet. Tell me a little bit about how to software. Is it just you? Is it you and an army of engineers? What is the, uh, what's the company about? It's me and an army of family. <laughs> it's mostly <laughs> just me. My, okay. my wife helps. Uh, she, she wrote the documentation. Uh, she writes some of the blog posts and my father the, handles bookkeeping. Nice. But on the development side and customer support side, it's me. It's all you. And where are you guys based? Uh, the company is based in Luxembourg. I'm from Luxembourg. I founded the company when I was still in Luxembourg. For the past couple of years, I've, I've lived in Switzerland. Oh, very nice. Beautiful part of the world. Excellent. And how long has, how did you have been around? Uh, I th think 
version 1.0 was released in 2007. Okay. So getting on. Oh, almost, five, almost a 10-year reunion. Point something. Or almost a 10-year birthday coming up here. Yeah, almost, yeah. And then what is the cost? Uh, the cost is uh, 39 US dollars for a single user license. And there's also site licenses, family licenses. It's Great. The regular price is $39. Okay, perfect. All right, well, we'll get into where to get it and where to find it and all that in a little bit after the demo. Next, we're going to do a demo. But of course, before we do the demo, let's take a quick break to hear from the show's sponsor. Hey, TWIP listeners, as you've probably heard by now, I'm running a workshop in Oaxaca, Mexico in January, and there's a few seats left, and I'd love if some of you could come along. Head over to photojoseph.com slash workshops where you can learn everything you need to know about it and hopefully sign up. With any luck, I'll see some of you in Mexico in January. This episode is brought to you by Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware purchase or software installation. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. Or when you make a call, your client can see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. Simply select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, and add multiple extensions for your business. Toll-free numbers are great for marketing and make your business sound more professional. You can set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. And you can also send and receive text messages from your business number. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twip. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twip. And we thank Grasshopper for their support. And we're back with Pierre Bernard of How to Software to show us his software, How to Geo. We've just been talking about what it does, how it works. But now, of course, we're going to see this thing in action. So, Pierre, are you ready to uh, show it to us on your Mac? I'm ready. It's... You're ready. All right. Well, let's take a look here. We're looking at, uh, at How to Geo now. Show us what we're seeing. So that's the How the Geo project window. So in How the Geo, you have the geotagging process that's divided or structured into three steps. So on the top left here, I have uh, three toolbar buttons to switch between the three steps. So I'm going to start out at uh, the first step, which is called load. So in this step, we're going to load our images into the project. So when I look at the project window now, I have the empty list of images, I have an empty list of GPS track logs, and on the left, I have my media browser, where I currently see my photos library. Uh, how so we're, you you're also... looking, we're looking inside of your photos library now. So that means that you don't have to do the geotagging before you import into photos. You can import them into photos and then geotag them later. You can. You, uh, how the Geo browses the photos library That's and then finds the master files or original image files uh, within the library so you can go and tag those. That's great. Okay, awesome. Go ahead. And it, it does the same with iPhoto and Aperture. And it can also browse the Lightroom library. The integration works a bit differently there, but still you would see your Lightroom library here. And of course, you can also get photos directly from your camera or file system if you do, don't use any of those applications. OK. All right, very good. I didn't realize that you could look inside of the Photos library, so that's fantastic. All right, go ahead. So I'm currently browsing my Photos library. I have a couple of pictures I took at the Taj Mahal. So I'm going to grab those and drag them over to my project window. Now the Geo is going to load those, takes a couple of seconds. And then it's going to ask the all important question. <laughs> the one thing it really has to ask and where it needs your help, it's going to ask how you have set your, up your camera clock. Okay. So 
There's a couple of options how you could go about to tell how the geo, how the camera was set up. The reason this is important is how the geo needs to know exactly when you uh, when your photo was taken. Certainly. So, so when your camera says 1 p.m., how the geo basically has no way of knowing if that's 1 p.m. London time, Los Angeles, New York, mm -hmm. or in this case, actually, Indian Standard Time. Okay. So I traveled to India and I did actually set my camera upon arriving. So I set my camera clock to India Standard Time, which is has the ab abbreviation IST here. Uh, so I tell how that you I set the camera to IST. It had no camera clock error. I really set it accurately. <laughs> and just to double check everything's right, how that is going to show me what the camera would show now if I hadn't changed the camera settings since. Okay. And now can you adjust it by, so you're holding the camera in your hand, looking at it, and you see the time that it shows there, and then you're looking at the current camera time and how to geo. Can you then just adjust the camera time and how to geo up and down until it matches what you're seeing on the camera? Yes. If, if my camera now would, instead of saying 01, would say 07, 08, how the geo would figure out the difference. And as time is running and I have stopped this clock, it's actually the camera clock error that's running. Nice. So let's say I, I have my camera clock set to 208 sharp or 208 sharp is coming up. And now it's there. Ah, uh, okay. I, I restarted the camera clock or the virtual camera clock there. Very nice. So let me ask you another workflow. Um, I've something I've done in the past because I let's say I'm traveling quite a bit and I'm maybe even bouncing between time zones um, or I just I don't want to deal with the importing at the end of the day and I know that or possibly before I get to it I'm going to change time zones again so looking at my camera and adjusting it may not really work out that well something that I've done in the past is take a picture before I start my my day shooting take a picture of my phone showing the seconds so I've got something that I know is accurate because it's the phone and so I've got a picture that even though the camera time may say something completely different to metadata time, I can see what time it was. So then I could calibrate based off of that. This photo was taken at 1,352 minutes and six seconds, and I can dial it in that way. Is there a way to do that type of calibration in here? Allergia does that too, uh, though I find the other method easier. Uh, so I switched to a second tab here. It's called Clock Photo. Perfect. So here, here I would select a photo. I would typically select a photo of my watch, my GPS track logger, or clock tower. <laughs> and then I would tell how the geo what time is shown in the picture. Awesome. So OK, perfect. Still, I need to tell it in what time zone that time is expressed. Basically, I have to remember what time zone my watch or GPS was set to. Or right, what... but assuming that the the watch or clock, say your iPhone, assuming that's accurate, because you're in India, it's already set itself automatically. So you know it's India, you know you can safely say that this is in India time. Uh, even if the camera was set to Zurich time and the clock was completely wrong, as long as I'm looking at the picture, I can see the time there, I know where I was, I can set that and everything falls into place. Yes, you would That's great. just for India, you have to switch to abbreviations. I don't have that uh, as GMT offset because it's a half hour offset. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you would <laughs> say that, that that photo was taken at 12.22 India standard time. Great. So, That's great. OK, cool. I usually work this way because usually there's only two possible values to enter here. Mm -hmm. Either I was lazy and I left it to uh, my local time, which is Europe Zurich, mm -hmm. or I was I had a good idea to set the time uh, upon arriving at destination, which I did here. So it's the time zone I visited. Right. It's right. Ease of the tour. Yep. Well, that's great. It's good to have the options in there, especially because if you don't, if you forget, you know, it's nice to just know you have multiple options. If you forgot, one of these options should work for you. Okay, go ahead and continue. So I let how did you load those pictures? 
So now it's telling me that this picture was taken at 6 a.m. on India standard time. Okay. And none of those pictures have latitude longitude coordinates. Those come out of a regular camera. So my next step is to also load a GPS track log into the same project. So I have the track log from the whole trip. While it's processing that, let me ask you a question. I'm a, I have a scenario myself where I've got old GPS logs from old receivers and I have a folder full of these things on my desktop that belong to some pictures somewhere in my library. Is there a process, and this is a bit of a, a bit of an ask, but is there a process where I can say, look, here's a library with 100,000 photos in it. Here's a whole bunch of GPS logs. See if anything matches. That's a bit of a bit of an ask, but I figured I'd ask. That's a bit of a stretch because you, you could travel many time zones and figuring out how to match that up. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it would for be a single, you single that vacation. It could be easy to say, I got up in the morning, I took a photo, or I started the track logger, and the first photo happened within the hour or within mm -hmm. minutes from starting the track logger. Sure. So one could guesstimate from there. Guesstimate for a whole lot of trips, different cameras, different settings. Yeah, don't worry about bound it. Bound to come out <laughs> wrong. I got to figure out what to do with all this old data at some point. Okay, go ahead. Back to your screen. So after I loaded the track logs, uh, how the geo automatically matched the timestamps on the pictures to the timestamps on the track logs. So the track log we are looking at here is actually the one from the last day of the trip. And you see that the timestamp from the early morning on the 22nd of August falls right between the beginning and the end of this track log. Okay. So obviously, I had it running for two days there. <laughs> Perfect. Alrighty. And from there, it automatically added latitude, longitude to all those images. Okay. So now I can switch to the second step. That's the process step. Here uh -huh. I can see a map. I see the track recorded by my track logging device. So that's the path I traveled. I see my list of pictures and I have a preview of the selected picture. This allows me to double check that how the geo got it right. Sure. Very cool. And you can see the, the dot, the um, pin on the map moving as you navigate through the pictures. You can kind of retrace your route as you walk through. That's great. Yes, there's a red pin for the, for the selected geotagged images. Ah, OK. So that's the photos I took. Super. The map currently is in the inspect mode. That's a read-only mode. So to double check without risk of altering locations, mm -hmm. uh, to adjust uh, positions or to geotech if you forgot to bring your uh, GPS device. Because mm -hmm. that happens all too often that I don't bring a GPS device, especially on shorter trips. Um, I have the geocode mode. That's the edit mode for, of the map. There I get a green pin. The green pin shows the location the map is currently centered on. And red pins show the position of the currently selected image. OK. So you can manually position a photo somewhere if you need to. It's mostly interesting for photos that uh, I couldn't tag automatically. It sure. also works for adjusting. Um, I have quite a few options here. The basic workflow is geocode and jump to location buttons. Mm. So either I copy down from the map to the selected image or I copy up from a selected image uh, to okay. the map. So currently I have the green pin, so the map centered over there and the photo down here. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to have my photo put there so I copy the location from the map down to the photo so Got that it. merged both pins mm -hmm. and okay makes sense I, I, let me show you that on other projects where I didn't import the track logs uh, it's going to make a whole lot of more, more sense when uh, working with pictures that don't have any latitude longitude yet um, I'm going to enable an option here to automatically jump to the next image and automatically adjust the map so that once I'm done with the first image it's going to move to the second one okay so I can I can move quickly uh, through the series of images okay I have selected the first image of the series I see the photo I took I remember I I went in there so to the left here that's this back check and I walked that past to that center plaza and then up through the great gate okay so the first photo I was there and I was looking to the left at that building that's what I see right here mm -hmm. I'm going to copy that location down to the image and now how the geo has moved on to the next image so nice. I see the new preview but it it held on to the location I, I stood at just in case you were standing in the same spot taking a bunch of pictures just in case I want to tag a, series, a second picture at the same location but also I don't jump around I, I just walked on that pass mm -hmm. and I barely moved from there to there and I'm looking at that tree sure so all I need to do is do that minor adjustment the few steps I walked and copy or, or paste that location to the next photo the one after I move through the plaza to the bottom of those stairs I just make that minor adjustment nice. copy that location there I, I am just looking up same location just copy it over there and then I went in there and looking out to the back door next location but I also wanted to show you yet another method of uh, geocoding with the map there I stood right there outside looking at the Taj Mahal first mm -hmm. view of the Taj Mahal I can take the picture and just drop it where I stood and that's my series of pictures geocoded without a track lock. Nice. Excellent. It's certainly not something you'd want to do for a thousand photos, but uh, if you just have a few and you forgot your your recorder, then that's certainly a way to do it. Nice. Alrighty. So then what's the next step? Now we've got all this geodata applied to the pictures. Where do we go from here? Here in the process mode, you have an inspector where you can also add uh, title, description, keyword, mm, generally okay. location-related stuff. Or It's not a full-blown uh, EXIF XMP editor. Uh, what could be interesting is uh, city and country. Mm -hmm. For that, I'm going to use uh, reverse geocoding. Awesome. Allergy is going to look up the location names from the coordinates. Again, here in the top right, I have the toolbar buttons that work for this step of the process. We already did geocoding using GPS data that's triggered automatically. You would go there only if you need to tweak settings. Okay. I'm moving on to uh, reverse geocoding. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, there's a couple of other options for geocoding. The one I have there is reference photos. That would be when you have your iPhone or another GPS camera with you and you take one picture with that just to remember where you went and then you grab your SLR, take a series of pictures and how that you is going to match those up. It's going to figure out if within a couple of seconds or minutes you took one picture with the iPhone and then a series of pictures with the SLR, okay. you were at the same location. Oh, that's, that's great. That's what I call reference photos. Reference photos. Okay, that's cool. I remember Aperture had a had a feature like that where it would take that GPS, uh, take the pictures from your iPhone, and then help you to align them up 
Um, so it's good to see this back in here, to see this here, because it's that is one of those things that a lot of people obviously don't have a GPS device. And of course, you can download any number of geo recording apps to your iPhone. I'm sure on Android as well and record the data, but those do chew up battery life. So it's nice to know that at minimum, even if you're for the most part, you just don't really care. But occasionally you really want that data there. You can just pull out your iPhone, snap a picture with that and then continue shooting. And you know that you'll have that geolocation saved somewhere. It's got to remember where you put it. Cool. That's great. Thanks for showing that. I'm glad that's in there. But we already have tagged our pictures with the GPS track log. Mm hmm. So what I'm going to do is reverse geocode. Uh, I have a couple of options. I'm going to have how the geo process all 86 images. And away it goes. Nice. Very cool. That's, now that's the offline that's writing... mode. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's the offline mode. So that's a downloaded database of uh, cities okay uh, doesn't take all that much space and allows how geo to go really fast okay it can also talk to uh, web services but you'll have to wait longer is there any advantage to having it do that uh, all those services have a different uh, level of quality or different ways to spell out uh, the, the city names. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, um, Got it. And then uh, also precision can vary. The, the database you have locally is also optimized to have a reasonable size. So if you want to go real precise, you might want to try one of the online services. Okay. Here I'm going to use the, the downloaded GeoNames uh, data, which is pretty accurate. It has the city name uh, where Taj Mahal is located. Um, that's all I need, actually. Okay. Excellent. Now, things like uh, I see in the, the metadata there, you've got heading and speed. So you were, would that show up if you were moving more quickly? There is a bigger time jump between the coordinates or, or where would that come from? Where would that data come from? That would come from a GPS device. My device does not record uh, speed or heading. Uh, okay. uh, he heading For heading, you need a GPS device with a built-in compass. Mm -hmm. And for speed, there are dev uh, devices that record speed. There's also software that could derive speed. speed from the track points. You could run that. Uh, you could run your track log through such software first. Um, not sure how accurate that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's it should be extremely accurate, right? Because if you know your exact coordinates at one point to another, it doesn't even matter. It would assume a constant speed between them, but point A to point B, you know exactly the coordinates. That means you know exactly the distance. You already know exactly the time. So it's not hard math to make that figure out the exact speed. Again, you are you would be assuming a constant speed, but at least you would have a constant speed between them. I don't know how useful that would be on a, a general use case, but it shouldn't be that hard to calculate that data. I think you would need to account for several points. I mean, there, here, I... Basically, I had, I had zero speed when I took my pictures. I, I stood at the location, took a picture, mm -hmm. and still you, you see my GPS track uh, jump around slightly. I, sure, I haven't sure. tried writing an algorithm to get to derive speed from track points, but I guess if you just look at two tech track points, the variation in accuracy of the GPS between the two recordings uh, would mess up a situation like this where I was walking slowly, standing still, sure. and still my GPS probably don't don't has doesn't have me twice at the exact location. Right, right, because it does tend to fluctuate. Even if you if you leave your GPS device sitting on a table, and it records twenty points, those points aren't going to necessarily be exactly the same. They do tend to fluctuate a little bit. Yeah, especially indoors. Obviously, when I I go indoors, often I see. Uh, like a star on the map, 
where, where it looks like I jumped around all sides of the, the, the house. Mm. I, I don't think I have anything like this on this map. But when you go into a museum or bring your GPS home, oh, like there, that's that's there probably our, our hotel. I wasn't moving at uh, light speed. <laughs> Yeah, so okay. there the software would need to first filter out gotcha. some track points before going on to calculating speed. Makes sense. Okay. All right, fair enough. So there are devices that will capture that speed and uh, and heading data, and then you can have that in there if, you, if it's well, if it's in the in the device. Excellent. So and it the, comes with in with the track log, how the G is going to use it. It's going to add a, a view offset onto the heading. What does that mean, uh, view offset? That means that when you say you're driving a car or you are on the passenger side of a car and you're taking pictures, you might be taking your pictures at a right angle out the passenger window. So the heading of the picture or the viewing direction of the picture is not the same as the heading. You're heading ah. forward and your viewing direction is at the right angle out okay. the passenger window. Well, that's getting really specific, isn't it? <laughs> I had customer request for that, uh, not for uh, using a car, but uh, on planes where the plane actually does the track recording. Mm -hmm. And that always points where the nose of the plane is. And okay. when you sit in the back and take uh, the photos out the side window, it would be all wrong. Right. So that's where the view offset comes in. Okay. Interesting. Something I've always thought would be one of the challenges, I guess, with overall having this kind of information, if you're shooting something that's quite close, like the Taj Mahal here and you're, you know, I don't know, 100 meters away or 50 meters away, whatever. Fine, it's obviously it's taken here. There's the Taj Mahal. I get it. But if you're shooting with a long lens and you're shooting, let's say you're a canyon, right? Something like the Grand Canyon and you're on one side of it and you're shooting a picture of something on the other. The GPS location is obviously going to be where you took the picture. But to some yes. degree it would be useful to know what where the thing that you're taking a picture of is. But right? if you're looking at the, the photo and it's GPS data, am I more interested in where the picture was taken or what the picture is of where that is? Right, Eiffel Tower. Let's say that you're a mile away and you're taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower with a long lens. Well, y your location is not the Eiffel Tower, but that really is what the picture is. So could you calculate a an estimated actual location of the subject based off of the focal length of the lens and if you could get to and I don't know if the metadata is there but if you could get to the focus setting of the lens you know that it is set to this focal length it is set to 100 meters and of course you get to a point where it's at infinity and then you're all screwed up but to somehow estimate that to, to have an idea of where that picture was taken I guess it would only work for closer things but uh, I don't know I always thought that would be kind of interesting to see uh, you could certainly Estimate it, you would need to start with a compass tied to your um, right. camera, to your uh, flash. Uh, hot shoe. Hot shoe, yes. That's, there, there are devices that do that, so you get an accurate heading or viewing direction of the lens. That's the okay. first thing you need. And then, indeed, you need the focal length and the, the focus. Uh, don't think you can get it really accurate without uh, manually right. uh, adjusting this. And I guess that's going to be way too much work for the benefit. Sure. I, I think it's, it's, for me, it's more interesting to know where I was and what's in the picture goes into the keywords or the description mm. so I can search for it later. Yeah, it's, it's just I, a, I didn't one of travel spots. to the spot that's in the picture. I traveled to the spot where where I took the picture. Mm -hmm. And also, if you take a panorama, what what were you really looking at? Were oh, yeah, you really you're interesting, <laughs> interested in what's dead center in there? I always have the interesting stuff kind of to the side. And sure, sure. No, no, fair enough, fair enough. I just thought I'd uh, mention it's just one of those thoughts that ever since I started looking at geocoded photos. If the, the sub, where the subject is is different, obviously, than what you're where you're standing. So, anyway, there are tags in XMP that would uh, distinguish between uh, subject location and mm. 
uh, what's it called? I don't know, photo location. It's, yeah. You, you could write both or read both out of a GPS tag. Because... Cool. All right, let's go ahead and continue. Uh, what else do we want to see in here? So we've seen how you get the pictures in, bringing in the GPS data, merging it, reverse geocoding it. What's the next step? Because we still have to hit output. Yeah, that's what we are really here for. <laughs> we we want to save or export our work. So the main use of how the geo is to export this data to uh, XF, XMP metadata tags. So the geo is going to write the location information, the coordinates or the city names mm -hmm. back into the original image files. Okay. So I'm looking at the Axif export uh, metadata settings here. I'm going to export all images. So I'm not going to limit it to uh, selected or geocoded images. Okay. I'm going to have it tag the original images. Okay. You could also tag the pre previous, but there's seldom be any use in that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have it tag the actual images right inside my uh, photos uh, library. And once it's done with that, it's going to uh, notify uh, the photos application that it has made uh, changes. So let's talk about this tagging the original images for a moment. What, if any, risk is there that something bad happens to that file at the point that you, you write to it, it somehow corrupts the file and it's no longer readable? Is this a concern at all? Is this something you've ever seen actually happen? I always recommend you have a backup. I never have seen it happen uh, on a normal hard disk. I tried tagging images on an SD card. Uh, there you can run into problems. Uh, for one, if you fill up the SD card, oh. uh, when, you, when the, the card is close to full, uh, during the tagging process, uh, how the geo creates a temporary copy of the file or actually how the geo relies on an open source uh, tool called exif tool that's the best out there for writing uh, metadata to image files and mm -hmm. it does a very smart thing before tagging the file it does create a copy and if it fails the copy remains around but oh, okay. if you have a disk that's close to full, uh, so a filled up SD card, you could run into a problem that the whole thing gets stopped because you overfill fill your disk. But so that's the worst that would happen is it would on stop? The SD card. Beg your pardon? That's the worst that would happen is it would just stop? It wouldn't corrupt the file? It should just stop. Um, I once ran into a problem when I tried it on an SD card, uh, but probably because I also grew impatient, uh, <laughs> tagging on the SD card was very slow. Okay. So I may have killed the process midway. I'm not sure. I I just don't recommend tagging right on the card. Sure. The r workflow I do recommend is to copy the images into your library you onto your computer tag them there and when all went right only then erase your memory card sure so for for the short period of time where you have a slight risk just keep the sd card or as a backup okay but you, so what you were saying though is the way that you do it is you create a copy of the file do you create a copy of the file write to the original and then throw away the copy once you verify the original is okay or are you writing to the copy and then throwing away the original Oh, that depends uh, on a couple of options you have. Uh, there's options uh, if you want to preserve uh, the file modification date or creation date, and depending on what options you choose, uh, the, the, the implementation details there change. Okay. I. But the point is the that your, your files are theoretically completely safe because you're you're creating a backup automatically and not getting rid of that until you verified that everything has gone well to to that point they are safe uh, there, there is a minimal risk that uh, 
uh, the, the file format is different than expected. So if you get a new camera that has a slightly different uh, f file format, like uh, so different uh, raw files, okay, it the process might complete. It might think all went well and well, it might have written to the wrong place. Got it. So okay. that's something you. I have never seen it happen. It's just so it's just an abundance in theory, of precaution. But the theory makes me recommend that at least when you start with a new camera, start with a new workflow, mm -hmm. have a backup first. Okay. So the easiest way to ensure it, as you said, is to you import your pictures, do the geocoding before you wipe the memory card. And frankly, you shouldn't be wiping the memory card until you've backed up your photos in the first place. So I always tell people when you're traveling, if you're going to have well, at minimum, when you're traveling, you import your photos, you leave them on the memory cards, so you have the two copies. Preferably, you have a hard drive with you to have a backup as you go. So you've got the ones in your computer and on an external hard drive. And if you can afford it, then don't even clear the memory cards at that point. So you have three copies and don't wipe those until your offsite backup has been completed. So once you're back home or in the studio, or wherever you go, that you have your copy in the cloud or copy in a remote server, whatever you're doing for offsite backup, which hopefully you're doing something for offsite backup. So you have those three copies. And at that point, it's safe to delete the card. Obviously, that doesn't apply to everybody. Not everybody's going to be that secure about it. But if you're doing that, then even if worst case happened and this totally destroyed your images, you'd have a backup, you'd have another copy. But like you said, it, it hasn't happened. You haven't seen it in normal scenarios. So that's great. So now you've, uh, you write the data to the original file, and it says notify media library. So that is somehow telling IFO, uh, telling photos, hey, We've made a change. Rescan the file. Uh, no, it's actually we're going to see it in the next step. So we have uh, the different steps of the or different options here in the export. Okay. Uh, this option just tells how the geo to automatically move on to the next step because it's the most common thing you would want to do. Okay. Um, for now, I'm going to write to the Exif XMP uh, metadata. And I just have a selection of uh, things I want to write back to the file. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let HowlerGeo do its work. Is there any advantage to geotagging your photos before you import them into Photos or Lightroom or whatever other app you're using? Or is it just as well exactly the same benefit, uh, no different benefit to just importing first and then running how to geo and tagging those pictures? I prefer tagging before importing into whatever cataloging software I use. But it's obviously more convenient to be able to browse uh, your how the, your photos or iPhoto or whatever library from how to geo. But there are advantages uh, to tagging before you import. Um, there's one I'm still uh, looking into that's uh, with uh, iCloud Photos. There's a bit of an uncertainty when iCloud Photos sends your master files to the cloud and if it sends updates. Mm. So if you use iCloud Photos, definitely tag before giving it a chance to upload uh, a version or an a version of the original you, you don't want to have in the cloud. Just like get your image complete with geotagging information before sending it to the cloud. Also, iCloud Photos has an, has an option of not keeping the originals on the computer. Sure, that makes it quite hard to tag them on the computer. So you <laughs> kind of have to get them back to tag them. Okay. So interesting. Um, so we don't basically you don't know at this point whether making a change to the file locally once it's already been synced to iCloud Photos Library whether it will then trigger iCloud iCloud Photos Library to update that original or if it could potentially just rewrite back down erasing the work that you've just done. Yeah, I have I have couple customer reports and it's non conclusive. It's probably a question of timing of. Yeah. If the images had already been sent to the cloud before sure. geotagging was completed, because you don't know when exactly they go up, probably when right. you're traveling and you don't have any connection, you might tag some pictures before they go up and some right. might right. go right. up later. 
Okay. My workflow actually, but that's with Aperture, that's no longer supported, is I, I keep my images referenced. I have them outside the Aperture library. Mm -hmm. And then I tag them there. And then I just add them to Aperture so I can uh, work with them, do adjustments. But my, my real collection of photos, I, I want it to be in, uh, in my file system or in sure. folders. Well, you can you can work that way with photos. However, once you can, once you bring them in, if you do make them uh, managed, bring them into the library, then you can't send them back out. Plus, if they are referenced sitting outside, then they do not get synced up to iCloud. Yeah, I, uh, photos can do that, but it's. I think it's an uncommon workflow, but it's it the workflow I prefer. It's it is an uncommon workflow. Okay, all right. So uh, let's continue and get this wrapped up. So we've got. You've done the uh, the tagging, so that's all been done now. We're looking at a Notify Media Libraries window. So, what Aperture, uh, what Howard Geo will do, it's it's going to talk to Photos uh, via Apple Script, and it's going to pass on the the adjusted values. So it's going to pass on uh, the coordinate values, uh, the description and title that, that I did not enter in this example. And so it does not ask uh, photos to rescan the image. It grabs the, the information and passes it on. OK. So now when I go to photos, I have already my, my moments. It figured out places names. Um, and I can check on the location here. And there it is. Super. And that's all there is to it. That is awesome. That is very good. There's oh. one more thing I wanted to show you. OK. That's a feature I really, really like. <laughs> that's Google Earth export. Mm. So that creates a Google Earth file from my images and my track logs. I'll just go with the default name. And that's going to allow me to view my images and the past traveled uh, within Google Earth. I haven't fired up Google Earth in years. Kind of forgot about it, honestly. <laughs> It looks the same. It looks exactly the same as it did years ago. It, yeah, it does. <laughs> so something tells you they probably haven't done a whole lot of uh, updating on this app, have they? But they have good uh, uh, satellite imagery. Yeah. And this file I could give to a friend to view my pictures. It's mm. basically it's a, a zip file. And okay. I have the, the path I traveled and... When I click on a, an image, I get the descriptions I entered, I get the photo. Fun. And sometimes, even for myself, if I find it good to rediscover or discover where I went, fo follow my tracks, and show people, tell people what the trip was. So we were on both sides of the river, from both sides, looking at the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. And you can see the detour we took. That's fine. That's the part where geotagging satisfies my curiosity yep. rather than need for archive. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that completely. I love being able to do that. And even, even if you're not geotagging, if you don't have the GPS coordinates, simply the ability to take your photos and drop them onto a map, and maybe not as accurately as you're doing here, but just to say, okay, these were all the pictures taken in New Delhi and just drop them onto New Delhi. And when you're stepping back and you're looking at that world map of photos that you've been taking over the last decade or two decades or five decades, because you can take your old scans and drop them on there as well, to see that on there is so satisfying and it's really fun and just to go, oh, let's look at those pictures from India. Oh, look, all the times I went to India and here's my six different visits to the Taj Mahal. And it's a fantastic thing to be able to do. It really is a lot of fun. So I'm I'm a big supporter of it. I just, I wish that more cameras would have GPS built into it. Obviously, if they did, then you wouldn't need how to geo. But the, it is frustrating that here we are, it's almost 2017, and still 
very, very few cameras are sold with GPS in them outside of your smartphone, which is one of the great yeah, and, advantages of shooting and, with a smartphone. And most cameras I saw with GPS don't really work all that well. Yeah. We actually bought one uh, as, a, as a gift for my father-in-law. Mm. And it looked really smart. It had an option of turning the GPS on only when you take a picture or keeping it running in a low accuracy mode so okay. to save battery life. And when you ask it to turn on only when you take a picture, it takes minutes to fire up. Yeah. And when you keep it running in low accuracy mode, you have a track point every couple of kilometers, half hour distance, right. and it still sucks battery. I, the, the, the iPhone really is a miracle device in that regard. It's <laughs> always accurate and keeps its battery all day long, almost. Yep. yep. You got it. Very good. Okay. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Um, we've been going pretty long here, and I just realized that I missed an appointment. Someone was outside my door while we were doing this because we started late. <laughs> Oops, my bad. Oops. No worries, not your fault at all. So let's um, let's move on. So we have seen the demo. We've seen everything we need to see in here, and that is awesome. Thank you for showing that to us. Where We're going to skip the pick of the week just out of, uh, uh, out of interest of time here, but let's just quickly go into where people can learn more about how to geo. So that would be on the website, howda.com. So H O U D A H dot com. Um, there's also a, there's the product information. There's also a blog at blog.howda.com where I uh, have uh, tips and tricks, uh, videos showing how to use certain features or how to best use it. And then there's a Twitter account, there's a Facebook page, but just go on to howda.com slash howdageo, download the demo, give it a try, and you're going to like it. Sounds good. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, and giving us a tour of the show, I th of the uh, of the app. I think it's great. I'm, I'm going to even skip my customary drop you off the call and say what I think of it because it's awesome. I mean, it really is. This is a great service. It's a great app. Uh, I know I've used it in the past. There's a lot of other apps out there that uh, kind of do similar things. But I think from my experience and looking at what you've shown me today, this is, uh, if not the, it's certainly one of the most complete apps out there. And it really does do everything you would need to do, whether you're bringing in your data from a separate recorder or you're just shooting the occasional picture on your iPhone to do the matching with. I'm really glad to see that feature in there because that is definitely a huge benefit. A lot of people don't bother to carry around a GPS device, don't own one, don't want to put the software on their phone because it will chew up too much battery life, which by the way, I should say for anyone listening, if you're not familiar with these things, there are GPS trackers, loggers rather that you can install on your smartphone and let them track the GPS data, just like that device that Pierre held up earlier in the show. Um, it just takes some of your battery life, quite a bit of your battery life, frankly. So it's not ideal if you're going to be doing it all the time. But if you just want to try it out, you can get these apps for you know, a typical iOS app, a couple of bucks, and you've got a GPS logger. And you can give this a try and see if it's the kind of thing that you want to spend the $100 or so on a proper logger to use. But thank you for showing this to us. It looks like uh, some great features in there. And it does, it does what it's supposed to do. And it seems to do it very well. So... Thank you so Thank much you for, for coming having on. me on the show. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Uh, last thing, you had a discount code that you wanted to give out to our viewers. What is that code? What's it going to get them? I do have a discount. So it's a coupon code. It's Twip Apps. Uh, it's, you can use that on the store at uh, howda.com or the store within the application. And it's going to give you a 20% discount uh, for the next two weeks. So. Excellent. Yeah, plenty of time to try. Okay. So that is going to be two weeks from when this airs. We don't know when this is going to air, so we will adjust accordingly. But whenever you are watching this, look at the the original air date of this episode. And two weeks from then is how long that code will be good for. So thanks for giving that to us, Pierre. We really appreciate it. I will say goodbye to you and we'll see you another time. Take care. And thanks again for coming on. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for watching that. That, of course, is the Twip Apps Show. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and you can find me on the social media at Photo Joseph or on my website at photoapps.expert. Thanks to our sponsor for coming on and sponsoring the show as always. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook and to visit our website at thisweekinphoto.com where you can sign up for our email list to be notified of new episodes and to get exclusive subscriber bonuses. 
If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And if you're watching on our website, you can subscribe to the show using the subscribe box on this page. If you have feedback, suggestions, or comments about the show, you can reach me, Photo Joseph, directly by using our contact form. Just click on the Contact Us menu item at the top of the webpage. And finally, if you're a developer and would like to be a guest on the Twip App Show, click that same Contact Us button at the thisweekinphoto.com and let us know what you've got. And with that, it's time to put that lens cap back on and go edit some photos. Thank you.